Hello, this is Kitco News coming to you from New York City. I'm Michelle McCory, and joining me now is Mike Lee, founder of Mike Lee Strategy, backed by popular demand. Mike, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Michelle. All right, Mike, let's start off macro and with this very disappointing jobs data, the U.S. economy creating the fewest jobs in seven months in August, the economy adding just 235,000 jobs, well below the 728,000 forecast. So what's your read on this? Yeah, so, so this um, this was as bad of job support um, versus expectations I've ever seen. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe some of the April and May numbers last year in the middle of the pandemic were worse headline numbers, but relative to expectation, this this is nothing short of a train wreck. Um, so a, a few things to, to take into account. Uh, one number does not a market make. Uh, last month was revised up to slightly over a million. Uh, we, we have the unemployment benefits falling off. Uh, that should make a big difference in um, in, in the next couple n- numbers. You know, we're hoping there's 10 million jobs open, that that's how that's going to play out. Uh, but basically, y- you have an administration who's uh, just absolutely tanking in the polls. So it's important for them to play up the risks of COVID, specifically the Delta variant. And I, I think, um, w- w- you know, whether whether the Delta variant is the is the apocalypse or whether it's uh, a fraud, either way, it had a dramatic effect because you ha- you saw job losses in retail and hospitality. And typically, um, you'd expect to. So the last couple of months, those are massive job gaining sectors, right? We we, we still, even though this month um, was a bit of a disappointment, you still saw over thirty thousand manufacturing jobs, which is good news. You'd like to see more. There's labor shortages throughout the manufacturing sector. So we have a very interesting right. labor market in that you, you have a combination of a skills mismatch uh, and people making too much money off unemployment to go back to work, mm-hmm. uh, as, as well as people people who are afraid. They're still afraid of COVID. And so um, the only the, the only issue that the administration is above water on is their handling of COVID. And now um, and, and so they're going to pivot to that any chance they get. But that's going to work against them from an economic standpoint. And Mike, what does this now mean for the Fed then in terms of being able to start pulling back on its asset buying stimulus at Jackson Hole? There were indications for the Fed to start tapering its $120 billion in monthly bond purchases later this year. So does this now alter the Fed position? So I I don't think they're in a hurry to taper. I think um, I I think at this point the bond buying the 120 billion dollars a month is completely unnecessary. It is it is not driven by data. Um, it is doing a good job of of supporting markets. Um, I, I I don't believe that quantitative easing helps the overall economy per se. I think it's it stabilizes capital markets. I think it played a vital role in making sure that the economy you know things did not get much worse last summer, but you could make it, you could have make a data-driven economic case that last fall, like cl- close to a year ago, you could have started uh, reducing from a 20 billion, you cut it in half. But e- even if they start in say November or December and they do 10 billion a month, that takes a year to wind down. At the end of that, you're going to have a 9 trillion plus balance sheet, maybe even close to 10 trillion. And then you have principal and interest coming off that balance sheet in the tune of three to 4% per year, if not more, which means you're still looking at three to $400 billion with the bond buying every single month. Uh, so we, we need to hear not only taper, you need to hear uh, balance sheet runoff before you get to rate raises. And before you start really restricting liquidity, you're going to need, you know, at 25 basis points a clip, you know, eight, to 10 uh, rate raises. So you're looking out like 2024, 2025 before you have an aggressive Fed, unless the economy somehow pivots and really starts to accelerate where they have to get overly aggressive. I just I, 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 I just don't see that happening. Well, Mike, because of these loose monetary policies, with the U.S. effectively seen as embracing MMT, the unprecedented fiscal and monetary stimulus, many leaders in finance have expressed concern that the U.S. dollar may be on its way to losing its global reserve currency status. Stanley Druckenmiller, for example. Now, maybe the dollar won't lose global reserve status now, not this decade, but that the road is being paved for dethroning the dollar And that recent geopolitical developments are going to accelerate that process. People like Robert Kiyosaki are seeing the debacle with the withdrawal from Afghanistan as hastening the process of the dollar losing its clout because it signals American weakness and vulnerability. 
and calling it the beginning of the end of the American empire. That this disastrous handling of Afghanistan fuels China's dominance and will create other geopolitical tensions, perhaps emboldens China to act against Taiwan or create other situations where the US under the Biden administration may be revealed as ineffective and erode confidence in the dollar. And given that the only thing backing the dollar is the full faith of the US government, the US losing face on the global stage doesn't really bode well for the dollar. So do you think that the Afghanistan withdrawal will have an impact on the dollar and the US economy? Uh, what, I, what I would say is you need something uh, to replace the dollar. And if you think things would be um, bad for the US if we lost our reserve currency status, um, think about how bad it would be for the rest of the world. Um, so when, uh, unless there's a real global superpower that's an economic powerhouse, the likes that has never, be been, might, never been seen before on the face of the earth, you're talking about massive global total depression, okay? At some point, that will happen. I do not see that happening in my lifetime. Maybe with the full embrace of MMT, where we're running seven to $10 trillion deficits on an annual basis in perpetuity. Yes, that, that could probably happen in the next decade. However, I, 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 uh, I, I don't see that happening. If you look at, so who's the other dominant economic force? China. So China's 15% of world GDP, yet less than 1% of um, less than 1% of international SWIFT transactions are done in Chinese local currency. The Chinese currency is, is, is good inside of China. Outside of China, it's essentially monopoly money. Um, you know, from, from what I've read and people like defectors from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, one belt, one road is nothing more than, it's, it's not a quest for world domination. It's simply a money laundering operation for members of the Chinese Communist Party to get their money out of the country. If... Um, if China was so strong and so dominant and you were a billionaire in China, why on earth would you want to take a penny out of it, let alone the bulk of your net worth, get it invested in London, New York, L.A., Vancouver, um, all, all, all across Europe? So um, right. it, it, it's like the fall of the Soviet Union. When, you, when they pulled back the red curtain, um, there was nothing there. It was all smoke and mirrors. The Chinese banking system is more levered than any other banking system in the history, in the history of the world. Um, you know, according to Kyle Bass, who I think has been all over this, it's rumored that 50% of the loans from many of these banks are bad loans. You just don't know because they keep rolling them over. So uh, I, I look, I, I, I um, and, and the euro, it has its own set of problems. So and that basically leaves Japan and Japan is, you know, Japan is far more levered than the U.S. is. So in, until somebody new, some, somebody new has to emerge to take over for the U.S. dollar, some say Bitcoin, some say gold. I, I just don't see those things happening anytime soon. All currencies lose their reserve status. So one day the U.S. dollar will not be the reserve status. I just don't think I'll be alive or my kids will be alive to see that. Uh, right. That, Okay, so, so you're saying for, for lack of better alternatives, you're not particularly concerned in the time being, at least for the next uh, four decades or so, that the dollar will lose its global reserve currency status. But you have to acknowledge that this Afghanistan withdrawal has created far more geopolitical tensions because it has signaled to many a weakness on the part of the U.S. government. We've got uh, China, for example, now conducting uh, military drills near Taiwan, uh, saying that this is in response to, quote, interference from external forces testing the waters there. And this coincides with Chinese state media that has attempted to paint the U.S. as a weak and unreliable power in Afghanistan. We had the Chinese state-run media Global Times publishing an editorial this week blaming the defeat of the Afghan government on the withdrawal of U.S. forces and suggesting that the U.S. would not defend Taiwan should Beijing invade the island and that that could lead to Taiwan seeing the same fate as Afghanistan. So the concern is that this has now signaled lack of faith in the U.S. military and in this U.S. government, and this may now stoke a whole range of other geopolitical tensions from China, from Iran, from other nefarious actors because they perceive America as weaker under this administration. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I, I'd say it's, it is obvious we're weaker under this administration. Instead of winning wars, instead of uh, keeping our enemies at bay, uh, our military leaders are focused on uh, social justice. So as long as that's that's a priority over uh, keeping the American people and the you know the world safe, um, it, I, I I think the geopolitical risk. Uh, as a result of the way we withdrew from Afghanistan is exponentially higher than it was just a month ago. I think China is absolutely emboldened. Um, I, I, I do not think any of that geopolitical risk is priced in the market. You've created a massive power vacuum. I mean, th th this is just something that's not being talked about uh, by very many people. I think it will soon catch on, but this is a massive overhang that, um, you, you know, the, the, we think we left Afghanistan and getting our troops out of Afghanistan is very popular. But in reality, uh, we stopped one war. Another one is, is just the beginning stages. The Taliban is far more emboldened. They have $80 billion worth of U.S. paid for military equipment. They're far more powerful. You're about to see a genocide over there. The likes we, we, we haven't seen in multiple decades. Um, so it, it's, you know, things are going to get far, far worse before they get better, unless, of course, uh, we see an administration make a U-turn on foreign policy, which is um, which is is not impossible, but it's unlikely because for them to make a U-turn, they need to admit that they were wrong. Um, and, and that's it's, it's just not something politicians uh, do. So I, I, I'd say, um, you know, I, I, I'd say buying cold right here at eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, is pro is most likely your best hedge against that. Um, again, I, I'm I'm not um, I, I'm not in the camp that because of inflation, gold is going to three thousand or four thousand dollars an ounce. I I was thinking that last summer. It hasn't happened. We've printed far more money. Inflation has ticked up, and yet gold hasn't moved. I'd say the trade for gold is yes. Uh, if China invades um, Taiwan and takes over Taiwan, which by the way controls like something like. Uh, seventy percent of the world's semiconductors and ninety percent right. of the super semiconductors. I mean, this this is this is such a massive problem. You talk about total global shutdown. Oh my! So why is this not being priced into the market? As you've just played out for us, tremendous geopolitical tensions with tremendous consequences if China does take some action against. Taiwan, which, as you correctly pointed out, is the leading manufacturer of semiconductors, and we already have a supply shortage of those. Why are you not seeing this priced into equity markets at all, and certainly not even really so much into the gold price? Yeah, look, I, I, this is happening in real time. And I, I do not think, I think there are many out there uh, that completely underestimate uh, the bad motives of the Chinese Communist Party. They are interested in total and complete world domination. Um, they are not. They, you know, they they are they are not our friends. The U.S. and China are not Coke and Pepsi competing for market share. They are looking for total, complete deni uh, demolition and annihilation of everyone else in the world living under the the Chinese Communist Party. So um, until you have that realization by many uh, in the media, many in the market. I don't think that risk will be priced in. I, in fact, think if uh, China did invade and take over Taiwan, um, you know, essentially as they did in Hong Kong, you know, very few, if any, are going to be out there uh, s s calling out the atrocities of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, they basically uh, reneged on their agreement with the English government to not, you know, 20 something years early to take over Hong Kong, throwing protesters in jail, locking them up and throwing away the key. How is it going to be any? And, and what did we hear about that? What do we hear about that? There's a little bit of pushback and then COVID happened and it accelerated in the middle of the night. So the, the, the Chinese, you know, the communist yeah. has no respect for humanity, no respect for the rule of law. Everything they do is a lie. Uh, and many in our media, many in our professional class, including much of the White House, are literally in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. This is a major threat that very few, if they know about, are willing to acknowledge publicly. Well, COVID did happen. Uh, some would say all too conveniently during uh, the height of those Hong Kong protests. Uh, but we won't fuel any uh, conspiracy theories uh, now. I do want to, however, fuel your thoughts on what the best way to position oneself from a 
individual investor point of view is for the next six months? So uh, historically, when you so I, I, I'm bullish on equities for now. Uh, I, I think the equity market has has a long, it, it, you know, if if China decides to simply work behind the background to consolidate power and not make big splashes, which is a very real possibility because many of their ruling class, ruling elites, uh, if they do make a strike for world domination, will cost them severely financially. So, um, you know, I don't want to say our interests are aligned, but if China were to get too aggressive overnight, they 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 run the risk of hurting themselves. How willing are they, you know, to, to cut off their nose and spite their face? So let's just say over the next six to nine months, we don't have any major geopolitical events and kind of this gets swept under the rug. Uh, I I favor technology in the equity markets. People are looking at the stock market. We're up 20% this year on a forward-looking price to earnings basis. We're actually 6% cheaper now than we are on January 1st. Okay, the the phenomena this year has been the inability of sell-side analysts to predict earnings going forward. Now, as as, as a history lesson, the most optimistic bullish people on earth in history are sell-side analysts from Wall Street. Their estimates are always too high, whether it's a bull market or a bear market. And what happens on January 1st, they say, hey, we're going to grow 20% this year. And then by the end of the first quarter, that was 18%, then 15%, then 12%. And then earnings will be up 14%. And they'll say, well, our, our, our estimates were only for 12 and we came in at 14. So they beat estimates. That's great. That's every single market. So w- what happened in just this past quarter earnings, we're up about 90% year over year. Given the conditions last year, you know that's a nice number. But on January 1st, I believe the estimates were for 20% earnings growth for the second quarter. On March 31st, it was for 53%. On uh, June 30th, for second quarter earnings, it was for 63%. And we came in at 90%. So I, I really think the sell side is having a hard time handicapping earnings. And as a result, the, the buy side is ahead of it. And so earnings are coming in far ahead of expectations. I, I believe us, you know, I, I said this the last time I was on and I was mocked in the, in the comments on the YouTube channel which is fine, but we are in a low growth, low inflation world and technology is going to continue to win. Companies that can grow revenues at 20, 30 plus percent and earnings at 50, 100 percent are simply going to be worth more than the overall market and technology is going to continue to lead. And what you saw in a COVID environment is a lot of small businesses just get crushed and massive companies take large amounts of market share. I think that's part of the reason why the job growth has been so slow is uh, people are less excited to get back to work for a mega company than they are a small business around the street, even if it's for the same amount of money. So people are, are, are less motivated to, to, to go work. Well, you know, that's, that's my uh, kind of off the wall opinion. We'll we'll see how that plays out. But look, every year you've been up twenty percent in the first eight to nine months of the year. The second, you know, the last three or four months tend to be a double digit return on top of that. So typically, w- when the market's right. going, it, it's going hot. I think the, the what's historically stopped these runs has been the Federal Reserve, and so we'll see how aggressive they get come springtime. All right. Well, Mike, we welcome a variety of comments from our viewers and a variety (laughs) of opinions from our analysts. And we thank you for giving us yours. Thank you so much, Mike Lee, founder of Mike Lee Strategy. Appreciate it as always. Awesome, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Keep it right here.